Russian forces heavily rely on repaired tanks and armoured vehicles pulled from storage to replace their losses in equipment. However, likely, Russia will not be able to sustain these losses in the long term, reports the US Institute for the Study of War, ISW. The report cites Ukrainian Center for Defense Strategies expert Viktor Kevlyuk, who noted that Russian forces continue to produce and repair about 150 to 160 new tanks per month, approximately 1,920 tanks annually. This roughly matches the current rate of replacing Russian tank losses. According to the Dutch open source project Oryx, Russian forces have lost around 3,558 tanks since the beginning of the full-scale invasion in 2022. Kevlyuk also mentioned that about 30% of all Russian tanks produced in a year, around 567 out of 1,344, are newly manufactured, while the remaining 70% are pulled from storage. He pointed out that, based on recent British intelligence estimates, if Russia continues to withdraw tanks and armoured vehicles from storage at the current rate, its stockpiles could be exhausted by autumn 2025. The British International Institute for Strategic Studies in February 2024 estimated that Russian forces could likely endure up to 3,000 annual losses of military vehicles over the next two to three years, reactivating stored equipment. Ukrainian military observer Kostyantin Mashovets had earlier estimated that Russia's defense industry could produce around 250 to 300 new tanks and repair another 250 to 300 annually. Western analysts report that Russia has decommissioned weapons accumulated during the Soviet era, but up to 70% of old tanks have not been moved and the rest have been refurbished and passed off as new. The Russians are also removing artillery barrels from old equipment and installing them on self-propelled howitzers. If this continues, Russia will reach a critical point of depletion in 2025. The much-vaunted Russian offensive against Kharkiv in the north that started in May is fizzling out. Its advances elsewhere along the line, especially in the Donbass region, have been both strategically trivial and achieved only at huge cost. The question now is less whether Ukraine can stay in the fight and more how long can Russia maintain its current tempo of operations. The key issue is not manpower. Russia seems able to go on finding another 25,000 or so soldiers each month to maintain numbers at the front of around 470,000, although it is paying more for them. Production of missiles to strike Ukrainian infrastructure is also surging. NATO Secretary General Mark Rutte visited a battlegroup exercise called Resolute Warrior in Latvia on Thursday. Ruta was there to promote European defense spending and production of military supplies. Ruta said that 2% defense spending by NATO allies is insufficient. It is simply not enough, he stressed, urging members of the Transatlantic Alliance to spend more during a joint press conference with Latvia President Edgars Rinkiewicz. Currently, some 3,500 Allied troops are training at Adatsi military base in Latvia as part of Resolute Warrior. Well, I'm just thinking, uh, in Latvia, the concession is over there. Uh, in my view, there will be a couple of big issues we need to debate over the coming months. Of course, first of all, we have to make sure that Ukraine prevails and that Putin will not win in Ukraine. That is absolute priority number one. But behind that, there are two other big issues at stake. One is that 2%, when you take out the US spending, we are now at 2% in Europe as NATO. It is simply not enough, as the president just was saying. It is simply not enough. So we will need to have the debate on spending more. And another big issue is defense production. We are not producing enough at this moment. We have to do more to replenish our stockpiles uh, to make sure that we are ready to face off any adversary. So these two issues, defense spending and defense production, and all of this working with our partners, the EU, but also in the Indo-Pacific, including Japan, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, the southern neighborhood, this is crucial. The, the United States is an integral part of NATO. They have founded their alliance. They are not into NATO because of some historical reason that they didn't want to repeat the mistake after the First World War. 
uh, not to repeat the mistake after the Second World War. They know that this is an integral part of their defense, of our defense, our collective defense. And sometimes we talk about frontline states. Let me make absolutely clear, the Netherlands and France and the United Kingdom are frontline states. Uh, we are there together with the Baltics, Poland, all the other member states of NATO. We are all frontline states. There is not uh, a, a frontline state which is closer to Russia or farther away from Russia. And we need the US, and the US needs us, we need each other to work on this. It was Trump who, from 2016 onwards, was pushing us on this part of NATO to spend more on defense. Look what's happening on Latvia, moving up to north of 3.5%, uh, overall EU NATO now at 2%, and we need to do more. We need to ramp up industry production. So on all of this, we need the US, the US needs us, we are together in NATO, all for one, one for all. President-elect Donald Trump on Tuesday said Elon Musk and former GOP presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy will lead a new Department of Government Efficiency, which is not, despite the name, a government agency. The acronym DOGE is a nod to Musk's favorite cryptocurrency, Dogecoin. Trump said in a statement that Musk and Ramaswamy will work from outside the government to offer the White House advice and guidance, and will partner with the Office of Management and Budget to drive large-scale structural reform and create an entrepreneurial approach to government never seen before. He added that the move would shock government systems. It's not clear how the organization will operate. It could come under the Federal Advisory Committee Act, which dictates how external groups that advise the government must operate and be accountable to the public. Federal employees are generally required to disclose their assets and entanglements to ward off any potential conflicts of interest, and to divest significant holdings relating to their work. Because Musk and Ramaswamy would not be formal federal workers, they would not face those requirements or ethical limitations. Musk posted on X, Department of Government Efficiency. The merch will be. Later he added, threat to democracy? Nope, threat to bureaucracy. Musk has been a constant presence at Mar-a-Lago since Trump won the presidential election. The president-elect has often said he would give Musk a formal role overseeing a group akin to a blue-ribbon commission that would recommend ways to slash spending and make the federal government more efficient. Musk at one point suggested he could find more than $2 trillion in savings, nearly a third of total annual government spending. Ramaswamy suspended his campaign in January and threw his support behind Trump. Where is he? Come on up here, Elon. He created the first major American car company in generations and his rocket company is the only reason we can now send American astronauts into space.